That is an important, actually very important topic these days. Everybody is looking for efficiency. And a lot of companies, especially big or medium companies, people are looking how, not how to redo their stuff in a different way, but keep it that way, just do it faster at scale. Big data, a lot of big data recently became literally big data problems. Before we had, okay, how do we collect more data? What are the algorithms to analyze more data? That was five years, ten years ago. Now, really, the problems are, we have all this data. We don't know how to deal with it. It's too much. Every single small companies and big companies I've seen or talked to or uh, you know, consult for, or my students went through, have this problem. We know in principle what we want to do. Uh, we have the algorithm, the plan, but it doesn't run. A lot of our students get funding, PhD students, simply because they could implement other people's algorithm on their data and make them run. We had at least three PhD students who got funding from biology, epidemiology, and economics. Well, these people knew what they want to do, but their SAS or R implementations of their algorithms just didn't run. So our students re-implemented Java and got funding for a year for that purpose. So big data is literally big. So skip lists attack that problem. It says, look, you can do something better here than a binary search tree. So you have Armstrong 4, which is sorting with a binary search tree. By the way, not everybody submitted that. I'm hoping that some people still working on it. Kind of, in terms of eating a lot of turkey, they submit that problem, right? I'll take them late if I have to. But you have to do demos. There's the implementation part. Those points you cannot get until you show it to a TA. TAs will now some hours. Uh, probably not this week, but weekend and the week after when you can demo your code for, for problems for and five. <laughs> so that's skip list. We gotta do that. But then we have to finish the regular material of the class, which is graphs. We don't have a clear mandate how far into graphs we need to go, so we'll go as far as we can. We have this lecture and the next Tuesday as lectures. And then um, uh, I'll have to, we'll have to discuss a little bit about BFS and DFS today because there's something in the homework, so, so make sure we do those. Okay, so skip list first. What do we have here? It's a link list, right? That happens to have all the values already in order. And we, we talked about this when we introduced binary search trees. And this would be a good list to have, uh, but I have to maintain it in order, right? To, to use it for sorting and to organize data within, I have to keep it in order. So now, what's the good thing about uh, a link list? Is that insertions and deletion is very simple, right? It's if, if I know where I want to insert an element, I break that link, I put element in there, and I, if I want to insert another square here, I delete this and I say, make it this and that, and now I've inserted that element in there, easy peasy. Problem with lists, like we discussed at the insertion sort, is that you can't really do it fast, find the position because lists don't have a structure to allow you to find where you want to put this element. You have to go from the beginning and check. You know, when you search in a link list, you start from the top and you say, my value is 75. I, I don't have a way like with arrays, binary search, to get immediately or very fast log n time in that spot. With binary search in a list, I have to start from the top and keep going, right? Everybody's with me here? So how did we introduce the binary search trees? Well, we said we like the link lists. In fact, some of you implemented binary search trees with pointers, like a list. But we like a faster way to get to that spot. In a link list, getting to the spot 
really needs traversal from the beginning. So that's what we want to do. Our purpose is still the same like in binary search trees here. We, we go, we're we going to organize this list a little bit. So what we're going to do, we're going to independently for each element flip a coin. And if we see heads, promote it. So let me start in here, skip list. There is this P is the promotion or head probability. Let's say it's one half, but it doesn't have to be one half. We can do this process with one fourth or one third or two thirds. But this, this P is fixed. What this means is for every particular box, the probability to have another box, so the probability of an upper box given the lower box, is this P value. So every time I see the lower box, the bottom list contains all the elements. That's such a regular link list. So for each one of them, I say, say this 34, I flip my coin. If I see heads, I put another 34 here. <coughs> that means I flip the coin here, I see heads, I put now here. Now that I'm here, I flip the coin again. And I say for this 34 here, do I, do I promote it again? So let's say I don't promote that one again, but I promote 50 twice. Uh, let's try to organize this nice. So let's divide it here. Let's go here. And the 79 is promoted quite a few times. 79. The 14 is also promoted. Uh, the 34, 50, 66, I think, is promoted once. Um, 79, three times. Then we have 96 promoted once. We have 110 promoted twice. And we have 125 promoted points. So to recap how this process goes, uh, first of all, it's independent. That's important, independent for each value box. So what happened to 50 that I flipped? How many heads I got here when I flipped this coin for 50? Two heads, right? At the first tail, I stop, right? How many heads I got here? Three heads, right? This is independent of the other ones. When I flip my coin for 79, <coughs> I don't keep track of what happened to the other values. I just take my coin and flip it, independent event. Head, head, head. When I see the first tail, I stop the promotion. That should be pretty straightforward given what we've done with coins and probabilities. I think we even did some fancy things like, remember that one with coupons? How many, what's the expected number of heads until you see the first tail? We did that in class. There was a proof on that board right there. Anybody remember that? What's the expected number of heads until you see the first tail? What was it? Two for this P, but in general is what? So the expected number of heads uh, until first tail, it's two for this probability, but generally it's one over the probability of the event you're waiting for. Tail will be one over P, so it's one over one over P. Uh, the way we did it was the expected number of trials until the first success, success is P, so the expected number was one over P. Right? So if P is two, the expected number of flips until you see the first tail or head is, is two. So this is a, what we call a perfect example because it looks deterministic. It looks like instead of flipping the coin, somebody really did this one four times, one, two, one, three, one, two. It's like, it's like uh, the, the promotion once happens every two, 
the promotion two times happens every four, and the promotion three times, you know, happens every eight. So that's kind of like perfect. Of course, when you flip a, a coin, you won't get exactly right. It's possible that these 72 get promoted. But this is just an illustration example. Okay. What we're going to do here is you're going to link every layer. So if we want to write the layers here, this is layer 0. That's the basic link list. That's layer 1. That's layer 2. That's layer 3. So we want to now link the layers like we have the bottom layer. We create another link list through each layer. So we have 14 will point to 34, 50, 66, 79, 96, 110, 25, right? That's a connection at layer one. This is a connection at layer two. And this is a connection at layer three. So each one of those make their own list. Of course, it becomes messy, and it's a question of implementation. OK, conceptually, it makes sense. You just draw these arrows on the board. But I have to write a computer program. How do I do that? Right? So there's a, there's a conceptual thing that you have to understand first. That's a link list on its own. And then there is a, when I go home with my computer, how do I make that happen? We'll talk about that in a second. OK. Now, um, so that's step number two. This is part number one. Step no, that's the promotion part. Step number two, each, each layer, it's a link list. You can call it back and forth. So double link list would be I have the arrows. I didn't draw them, but you can have the arrows the other way too. So you know in a list how to go right and how to go left. And you can also know in here, of course, I know if this is promoted up or not. I'll have a stack value. The stack value for 79 is four or three promotions. So if I'm here, I know there is not another 79 up. Or I can implement that with a pointer. This goes to null, means there's nothing promoted on that one. Now, part number three is some theoretical questions. On the board, mathematics, how many layers are here? Like, if I do this literally with a coin, I have n elements. n is the number of values to sort or maintain. Uh, so n is the kind of the input size here. How many levels are this I'm going to have? So we already did this. If I fix a value and I run the promotions, right? Uh, what's the expected number of layers? Two. But I don't have one value. I have n values. Right? If, if I ask you for one time, what's the expected number of edges you're going to get when you flip 79, you're going to say two. We did this in class with coupons, right? But what if instead of one value, I have 15 values? There's got to be intuitively the chance of getting higher is more than two because every one of them expected value is two. The more things you have, chances are every once in a while it's going to go up, right? Clearly, if I have three values, I don't expect to go very high. But if I have a million values, one of these promotions might go to like 10 or 15. I don't know. Because each one of them has a small probability, right? Expected value is the two. Okay. But, but out of many, one of them might have a high promotion stack. Make sense what I'm saying? Hands up with you. So how many layers? This is per, per value. It's easy, right? Expected of uh, number of layers. We already said it's two or one over p. But what about total? Like maximum. Maximum for n elements. Because right? we, we don't add them up three plus four plus. We say, what's the maximum level where you got? So how do we do that? That's a tough math question. Number of layers. This is per, per value. We don't know how to solve that question yet. Maybe we need to bound it, like in algorithms. We say, well, we can't tell you exact. But we can tell you that it's about asymptotically 
something, right? We, we don't want to put an exact math value, but for, for computer science, when you do these kind of things, you don't need always the exact, mathematically, it's interesting to know what's the exact number of layers and expectation. But for a computer scientist who writes a program, says, if you promise me it's like asymptotic, say, linear, that's good enough for me. I know my, my number of layers won't be more than n, or, or something like constant times n. So the answer to this will be asymptotically log n. And whoever proves this gets a cookie. <laughs> that on expectation, when n goes to say big, a million, a trillion, a gazillion, how many clearly this slowly going to have more layers? Eventually, one of these stacks is going to get higher, right? Well, how high is it going to go? Like, I don't want to go to that proof necessarily today, but you have to think of a binary search tree. Remember what happened to the binary search tree? When I add elements to the tree, assuming the tree it gets balanced, if I add n elements in the tree, what's the depth of the tree? Log n. That's the same thing happens here. Because this is effectively a binary search tree. That's what it is. It's just drawing differently. Think about how am I going to look for this element 72? If, you, if I give you this structure, how you look for this guy? You have the whole control. You implement it. You can go back and forth everywhere. You know all the stacks. You know who's who. But you don't have array. What's, what arrays have that links will never have? Index and direct access to indexes. In arrays, you can say, go to element 5, 7, 11, whatever you want. In lists, you cannot do that. You can so go up, down, left, right, if you have that element in there. But you can so go to the fifth element. That's not possible in the list. So arrays have that direct access, lists don't have it. So how would we look for 72? How would we do that if we have this structure? We start at the top list, right? And we say, compared to 14 and 79, where is 72? It's in between those two, right? So go down at 14. So I'm searching for 72. At 14 here, I check 14 and 79, both of them. And then I say, go down, right? Now, I'm in between 14 and 50. What do I do? Go right. 50 and 72? Go down. Now, I'm at 50. I already know it's not less than 50, right? So now I'm 50, 66. What do I do? Go, go right, because 66 is smaller than 72, right? And now, 66, 79? Go down, and now I'm in the bottom list. In the bottom list, I always go right until I find the value. So if you think a little bit how happened in the binary search tree, right? I mean, we can redraw the whole thing with the binary search tree. At every point in the binary search tree, I went roughly, uh, I went always left or right. So if, if you compare to, to analogy versus BST, In, in every move in BST that goes left, it corresponds to what kind of move in here? Down. Down. And in BST, when I go right, higher, then in, in here I go right. next, usually to the right. But next means in that direction, right? So I think it's a perfectly good analogy with, without proving things. That whatever, if you, if you think of this as an exercise, put it in a binary search tree, every time you go left to the smaller side, list goes down. And every time you go right in a binary search tree to the higher side, you keep going to the right in here. And then you can see that the search path in here is roughly that. Now, because we did binary search tree with the expected height, Roughly, it's log n if they balance. And we show most of them are balanced unless some adversary plays with the input, say, puts it in a, run, in a, in a sorted order to not make it balance. Uh, then the output is okay. But we still need this proof. This in here, we don't have. We did a coupons problem. This proof, expect a number of trials until you get your first success is that. But we didn't do this. So this might require some trick there. 
That's the math. We may have some more questions of math later. Uh, so that's the search. How about the insertion and deletion? When I delete something, how is that going to work? Say I want to get rid of the 66. How do I do that? Is it a fast operation or slow operation? Fast. I have to get rid of 66 from both lists. Can I just link the links through the next after the 66? Is that, is that going to work? Like if I say delete 66, delete this, delete this, and make the pointers go to the next one. Would that be OK? I think it is. We will need some verification, some proof that that's OK. But if the intuition is that I can just delete it from all the lists, and I'm done. How about the insertion? Say I want to insert 75 in here. How do I do the insertion? So let's write that down, deletion. Just the intuition. Delete the whole stack. Remake links. What insertion? So this in here is the search. How would insertion work? If I throw in a 75, first I have to search for it, right? Would search give me the right location where to put it? If I search for a value, like in a binary search tree, when I search for a value that's not in the tree, what happens? I get exactly to the spot where I'm supposed to put it, right? That's exactly what's going to happen here. If I search for 75, the search path is going to be the same up to here. I'm going to go over 72. In here, I'm going to determine insert 75. So if I want to put insert 75, I do a search for 75. And I've got to this spot, like with the same path I got to here. That will be where 75 needs to go. And now, how do I literally place 75 in and create a stack? What, how do I do it? Once I determine 75, it's in this spot. The bottom list is just a regular list, right? I can put 75, make the links, right? So 75 in is just a normal link list. But how about this stack? How do I manage that? So once I place 75 in here, I can remake the pointers here to, to, to make the links work correctly. 72 will be now, I break this link. So 72 will go to 75. This will go here like that, make a list. And then if I, I get my coin here, right? I throw the coin once. If I see a head, I do what? Insert 75 in this list, right? If I see another head, I, I insert 75 in this list. And when I see a tail, I stop. Is that, is that an easy process or how many times am I expected to flip this, this coin? Two. Two times. I would say the whole thing is a constant operation overall in expectation. The insertion, it's remake two pointers. And then the flips are expected to be two of them. Of course, it could be a long stream of, of flips. But on expectation, it's a constant two. And then remaking every, every pointer here, it's, it's also a constant time operation, right? The part that takes more time is this, right? Log n. This, the search, how to find a spot for 75 will take some time. But inserting 75 is like in a binary search tree. It's a constant time operation. Hands up who's with me so far. Questions? I, I know this is difficult to swallow. And uh, there's a difference between a picture and a nice story, which it's easy, versus an actual, OK, go home, study, do the math, implement. It's a step in there. That's why this is honors and not regular stuff. Now, the search. That's the biggest theorem. That says the search takes log n time 
with probability very high. Let me quantify what verify means. But I want somebody to explain. I'm going to tell you about what very high probability means. I want to understand exactly the difference between what does this statement mean versus what was the statement for binary search tree? In the binary search tree, we had search takes on average log n, right? This is keep list. This is the binary search tree. So this was saying expected of the runtime for search is asymptotically log n. This one says with very high probability all searches takes that. So which statement is stronger? If, if I have this, it implies that, or if I have this, it implies that. Which one is the strongest statement? By high probability, I mean astronomically high probability. Like 99.999999 of the searches will take that time. So which one is the strongest statement here? Like, if I really want to run this program, I want to avoid not being log n searches, right? I, I don't like when the searches take more than log n time, linear. Which one would be more likely to give me some linear searches, the binary search tree or the skip list? That's what I'm asking effectively. Yes. I think the binary search tree. Will, will give me more non-logarithmic searches? Yes. Right. So if you think of an average, can I have an average of log n? What does that mean? If you look at all possible searches, these are all the searches. The question is, out of those searches, how many searches have runtime, say, about linear? Just a bet, right? Because they're not log n. Versus in here, how many searches have runtime about linear? You're right. Even though the average is log n, the number of searches in a binary search tree that's still not log n could be linear. That could be some good number of searches. And the reason that is significant is because this depends on the input. If you create a binary search tree for a certain input, that binary search tree could be effectively a list. So the, this depends, let me write it big, depends on input. Right? If my data is sorted, either forward or backwards, or mostly sorted, can I get the tree to have a long branch of things? Suppose half of the data is sorted. I have my students and I want to create a binary search tree by age. Now half of the students are already sorted, the other half is not. Is it possible that half of the students sorted create a branch in a tree of size n by two? That's half of the tree. So now the searches in that half are all linear searches. Ends up with So I'm talking about the bad tree the one that's like this. Because half of the data is on one list. In here, the statement is, no matter what the input is, this depends on what? The, the ability to have bad searches here depends not on the data, but on what? So what will determine that I have some bad search? Stacks depend on what? The coin flips. Is it possible to get a long stack here and no stacks for the others? So I'll end up having just the bottom list effectively for most of the data? 
That's possible. Is it possible to have a stack here and a stack at the end and in the middle no stack at all so I'm forced to go one by one in the middle because I have no way to go from the top? Right. But that's not depending on the actual values given to me as input. Those, those 50, 59, 60, 79. Those could be in order, out of order. The coin flips are independent of what the value is. So it turns out that coin flips are much more reliable than the input data. The chance of having no tails, no heads, or a lot of tails, or a lot of heads with a coin, it's extremely small. In fact, casinos, they act 100% probability when somebody has this unbelievable streaking, you know, streak of wins, they know for sure that guy cheated. The chance of having, you know, one over two to the hundred probability to win something is zero. Nobody in a casino business will ever believe that was just a coincidence. Everybody will be like, this guy is a cheater, hundred percent. You can arrest it right now. No worries about probabilities. What's the chance that, um, you know? Somebody who hated a journalist, you know, in an embassy, that guy happened to die in the right embassy, you know, like, like, <laughs> zero. <laughs> These coincidences with low probabilities never happen, okay? What's the chance for a bank loan? It looks at you, like, like somebody has no salary, has no job, but he says, you know, maybe I'll become a millionaire because I win the lottery. Bank will not give you a loan. Zero, you know? So, uh, in practice, and in mathematics, in theory, very high means exactly that. What's the chance of getting something extremely unlikely? We can quantify with math, but the intuition says coins are pretty reliable. If something is wrong, if, if you don't get the list you want, your coin is bad. It doesn't, doesn't flip properly. If you get too many heads or too many tails, it means you're not flipping it correctly or the coin is fake. So, uh, there's a quantification here. Let me write it down exactly what this means. Probability of search being uh, all of log n, like we want, is at least 1 minus c n. So it turns out I can increase this power. Once n goes to infinity, I can make this n to the 2, 3, 4, 5, any power I want. So imagine if this is n to the 10, when n goes to like 100,000. How much is 100,000 at power 10? That's 10 to the 50. That's exactly 1, right? If, if this denominator here is 10 to the 50, this value is extremely close to one. So that means the probability of having all the searches that I want, even for a data that's not so big, I'm talking 100,000 items, that's not a big data anymore, right? It's gonna be effectively one. That's why this is more reliable than this. It does not depend on the input, and those probabilities are astronomically high. This would be 99, 99999 with 59 until you get something that's not nine. Did you say C was some constant? C is a constant that depends on the alpha. Oh. But nevertheless, this, if you plot it, it's going to be a function that gets very close to 1 for any practical purpose. <coughs> I don't think anybody ever run a skip list with a, with a correct coin and not got something good. Like, you know, what's the chance of getting with even 100 elements some sequence of 50 values with no stack? Alpha is uh, our choice. Alpha, alpha is a choice. Uh, C is a function of alpha. So there's some math details that I don't want to get into because they are complicated, require more knowledge of properties than we have. But you can easily get the intuition that this value is so close to one that it's effectively a guarantee that's going to work. Like I said, those problems in reality, when people see them that they, you know, do not happen they automatically assume something is off. The problem is so small that the person who won every day at the casino must be a cheater somehow, must have found a way to cheat. Okay, so now, uh, one of the questions in the skip list for whoever read the problem, the honest problem, it's an optional 
question, so you don't have to do that one for the credit, is to explain this proof. The proof is given, but you have to explain every step of it. How did we prove this? How did we prove this? So on and so forth. So as an optional question that does not require, you don't have to submit it if you don't want to, is to go over this proof and explain why search is that with very high probability. Now, how about the implementation? I think everybody understood how the search, insert, and delete. We only have three functions here, search, insert, delete. And to print it in order, you just read the bottom list in order. There's no, no, no complication there. How can we implement this? Obviously, we can do pointers, right? So option number one is pointers. We have this massive object. that has what? Has a value, like 66. Has a stack value, is one promotion. If you count this as layer zero, that's one. Right. It has a next, at layer zero, next is um, 72. But it may have next at layer one, because it has a promotion of size one. So 66 also has a next at 79 without the 75 there. You know? And uh, you may have previous at layer one. That is who? At layer one, what's the previous? 50. And previous at layer zero, who's that? Fifty-nine. So whoever does this with object will have an easy time. Because you can define an object and that object you put next, last, an array, a vector, whatever you need to put in there. We won't grade how elegant your code is, so you know if if you make it work, that's that's good enough. Now suppose I don't know pointers, I don't know Java, I don't know C, I don't know anything. Uh, what do I do? Can I do this with a massive array? For binary search trees, we could do it with array, but in this case, that array will have to become a matrix. So my matrix will be called next, and will be exactly, here the indices, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And here's the, layers, 0, 1, 2, 3. So if I want to say next for element uh, 3 at layer 0, next for element 3 at layer 0, I keep track of indexes here in an array notation. So what index is the next index for index 3 at layer 0? 4. What index is at 3? And layer one, what's the next index here? Five. But who's, I can have a previous matrix. Who's the previous of, say, uh, index nine at layer two? Index nine, one, two, previous, what the index is there? Five, those are indexes. And then I can have an array of values that's a simple array, right? The value of nine is 79. I may have to have a, a, a structure to keep the stack, you know? That could be either an array up. I think the easiest way is to do it with a stack value. Stack value of array uh, at 11 is one. Stack at 10 is zero because it's only one. Stack at 13 is how much? Now, remember in binary search trees how we manage those indexes? What happened when we deleted an element in a binary search tree? We, we, we free that spot. If we deleted an index, we say this spot is available now and we remake the tree structure. What's gonna happen here if I delete the 66? 
I'll have to redo the, the matrices, right? The next, if I delete 66, I'm actually going to say uh, the index, what was it, 7 is available now. Like, after deleting 66, you can use this to store some other value later on, because this 66 is gone. But what would be my, my pointer? So when I say next of 6, 0 will be who? If I delete the 66, who's the next after index 6? 8. And so on and so forth. So I think this can be implemented with a bunch of array and matrices with a caveat that when you delete stuff, you can't really free that memory. In an array, if you delete 66, you can make it disappear from the structure, which is what you want, but you cannot free that memory, that 66 spot, which was in index 7. All these matrices will still have an index 7 that I can use later on. If I insert a new value, I can put it at 7, right? But the memory, when I delete, in a list, when I delete an element, I free that memory. In an array, I cannot do that. So what happens if I insert, say I insert the value uh, 105? Can I put it at index 7? This one that's become available? Yeah, I can put it at index 7. I can say value at 7 is 105 now. That's because this one available here. But how do I make the pointers now? After 6, I still have an 8. Because remember 66 is gone? I'm going to insert here. The value here is going to be what? 105. But the index will be? Index is 7. Because I'm inserting that, the indexes will not remain in order, because otherwise I'm maintaining an array. If I keep the indices in order or the values in order, I'm effectively maintaining an array. And that's not what's going to happen. If this index 7 is available, I'm inserting 105 in there. And then how do I remake those pointers? If, if I do this, what would be the next of 12 at layer 0? Zero? Zero. That would be 7. Who would be the next? of 7 at layer 0, 13. 13. Uh, if I stack this up, if the stack, suppose I got two 105s here, because I stacked it, right? I flip my coin, I get the head one time. Uh, so the stack of 105, well, of, uh, number 7 is now 1, and then I have to make another pointer, how do I do that? Next of 11, index 11 at layer 1 has to be the 7 now. And next of 7 at layer 1 has to be who? So I think you can manage this this way if you don't want to do pointers. That's going to give me some headache over the Thanksgiving, I think. But it's a good headache. Everybody <laughs> has to go through those headaches. All right, so that's, that's the uh, skip list. Uh, I want you to implement it and to observe that works. Um, I, I, would, I would not require for the submission, but you know what would be really, really cool? To actually verify empirically the runtime create a list with a million of insertions and deletions and updates at random with the size of, say, 2,000 elements. Just do it, millions and millions of operations, and measure the clock time, how long this thing takes, like literally in seconds. Um, but I do want you to remember um, two things here. Mathematically, the size of the stack, even though it's many elements in the list. The size of the stack is logarithmic, just like in a binary search tree. That's observation number one. Observation number two, it's different as a binary search tree. Binary search tree gives me an average that depends on the input. 
this gives me a vast, vast, vast majority of cases, not just the average, and does not depend on the input at all. It only depends on how my coin rolls. Uh, and a hint of the proof, assuming I have the math here. The way to think about this problem mathematically, the search, remember the only complicated thing is the search, because insertion deletion is very easy, just mechanics. The search, how do I, this, this whole proof that you have to go over, here's what I'm going to think. It's a pretty cool idea. I want to know how many steps it takes to find the 72 or the 75, they're in the same spot. Instead of that, this proof goes backwards. Instead of thinking, how did I get to the top, down or forward to 72, I'm going to think from 72, how do I go back to the top? And I'm going to say, this 72 or 75, either one. When did I move from the left? When did I get this way to it? And this is clearly a path here, right? This path has steps that go to the right next, or steps that go down. So if I look at the path backwards, I'm going to go sometimes to the left, sometimes up. So the first thing I'm going to say is how many times I go up maximum. That's the size of the maximum stack. Assuming these proofs work out, it's log n. So any search will take log n steps to go up. That's easy, right? The next idea is super cool. It says, what happened when you went for the search, it had to do with how you flip that coin whether you flip the coin to promote that element or not. We're going to simulate that process, but not from the top, but from the 72 back to the top. So we're going to say, you know what? I'm flipping a coin here, which is not the way I produce this list. I'm saying it's the same process. I flip a coin here. If my, ploy, if my, head, my coin comes heads, I'm going up. If my, coat come, my coin comes tail, I'm going left. And I'm saying that's a one-to-one -one map to how the search happened. Instead of flipping those coins for the promotions, I'm flipping the coins for the search back from the 72 down to the 14, up to the 14. Every time I get a tail, I go this way. Every time I get a head, I go up. Because any promotion, I go up to the side. And every tail, I go to the left. So I'm thinking of this search as, you know what, I'm starting at post-mortem, I'm starting where I'm supposed to get at 72. And now I'm flipping the coin. If I go uh, tail, it's left, head, it's up. And I'm going to recreate the pass to 40. This kind of, uh, you know, yes. Under that thinking, what happens if you flip heads to go up, but there's no more values to go up in that stack? Right. Uh, this, if by flipping the coins, you can't recreate exactly this path. Okay. What the theorem is saying is that by flipping the coins, you get ex ex an expectation the same number of ups and downs as you flip them the other way. Okay. Because the property of heads is independent of this event, so every every going up, it's effectively a head chance p. Okay. That requires some some thinking about. But let's assume for the moment we can come back to that step. Let me tell you why these people think this. Because they want to say, how many steps does it take to go up? Only the up steps. This step, this step, this step. That's maximum number of levels, which is log n. And then, if I have my coin, how many times do I need to flip this coin total, heads and tails, to get that many heads? So that's another proof that's needed here. After this, if I want log n heads. It's like in the coupons, remember? How many steps until I get the first coupon? How many times until I get the second coupon? How many times I, until I get the third coupon? But this is much easier because every head will have to wait for the same number of steps. In coupons, once you get one, chances are that now it's, it's, it's fewer coupons to get. In here, it's the same. So this is, I want that many heads. How many? Uh, coin flips total. This is easy. This is hard. But this is easy. We said already to get ahead, 
you get on average two flips, right? So to get that many heads, how many flips do I need? If this is not reducing the coupons, it'll be two times number of log n, which is the same, log n. So if every success takes on average two flips, if I want that many successes, I'm gonna take two times that many flips on average. But this is requires a trick. Now back to the, you have a question about the first part. How is it that I can think of these coin flips backwards? No, I just had a general question. Uh, is, it, is a coin always the best thing to flip with? Yeah, it's an independent coin. You can choose the probability. The probability, if it's not a half, say it's a fourth or two thirds or something, will, will dictate, will balance a little bit how, how high you want the stacks versus how much linear set you do at the bottom. If you use a coin of very high probability, say eight uh, out of 10, the stacks will go higher because the chances are in promoting more elements. But then the, the linear searches in a list will be very small. If you do one half, I think most people do one half or one fourth. All right? So that's all I have to, be, to say about link lists. And that requires some study at home. And uh, you guys have. Uh, this week and the next week to do this. So next week I'm expecting there will be some people lost at office hours. Hey, I tried that. I, I'm really not, not sure how this goes. But I'm going to say right now, I don't want to emphasize the math in this homework. So there's all this math probabilities proof, which they're optional. What we're really going to care about is if you can make this work or not. So for making it work, you just literally flip that coin. I mean, the computer does for you. Uh, and you don't have to worry, oh my God, what if I get too many, too many uh, a stack that's too big here? You don't have to worry about that because there's a math proof that says you can get, you know, flipping a fair coin, there's no way to get that many stacks. If you see this stack going to like size 100, you did something wrong. You flipped the coin incorrectly. <laughs> So that being said, let's uh, move to, to trees. And uh, trees and grass. What did we do so far about graphs? <coughs> We talk about directed versus undirected. Remember? We talk about paths. And so that is directed is when edges have direction. Undirected means when edges don't have direction. I can go both ways. Paths and cycles, that has to do with something like this. That's a path. And this is a cycle. We talked about, um, did we say complement? Graph complement? By the way, when I say G, I mean graph. Everybody does that. You say G, it means a graph. So, or G equal VE, that's the vertices and those are the edges set. So here's what the complement means. Same vertices. Flip the edges. Uh, by flip, you you gotta be very careful with these words in mathematics. Flip. What does it mean? Some people might say flipping an edge is putting it backwards, no? That's not what it means. It means make a zero become a one and a one become a zero. So if I have this graph here, say four nodes. What is the complement? The same four nodes, let's call it A, B, C, D. But the edges that were in the original graph are missing here. And the edges that were not in the original graph are here. So A, B 
was there, so it's not here. BC was there, so it's not here. DC was there, it's not here. What edges are here? AD. Yeah. Is that it? What are the total number of edges? Total possible number of possible edges. You had that in a quiz, right? In a in a quiz, it was like total handshakes. How many of them are there? V choose two, which is V times V minus one by two, right? Right. Is that what you got for that problem? Right. So isn't the total number of edges the edges in here plus the edges in here? The edges, the size of edges in the original graph plus the size of edges in the complement graph has to be all the edges, right? Because an edge, it's either in that graph or in this graph. Right? Every single edge, it's in here or here. Exactly in one place. So how much is 4 choose 2? In my example, I have four vertices. How much is 4 choose 2? Six. six. So the total number of edges have to be six. Every edge that's in here, it's not in the other place. We talk about clicks, right? That's complete graph. All edges. Here's a click. What's the complement of a click? If you look at the click and you take the complement of it, what do you get? No edges. You just get the vertices, no connection between them. Because they all the vertices are in the all the edges are in the click. When you say complement means no edges left for the complement graph. Um, we talk a little bit about trees. Let me recap that. Trees. What trees have to do? They have to be connected. Graphs can be disconnected. Right? Is this a connected graph? Is this a connected graph? No. B is disconnected from the rest. Uh, trees have to be connected. If you have not connected trees, you gather four. Because there's multiple of them. And what else they have to have? No cycles. And they can have optional. They can have a root. The rooted trees, when a node is designated as root, and unrooted trees, where you can have a graph connected with those cycles, but nobody named a root yet. Uh, many interesting problems are circulated by emails about trees for the final exam. Everybody throws in trees. I, I didn't, I did, I'm not guilty of that. I didn't throw any trees in yet. Just a lot of emails flowing around. How about this tree problem? How about this tree problem? How about this tree? It would do that. It's interesting because it's induction and counting and probabilities in one. Uh, nice. <laughs> That's vehiculated for the final exam. I'm not guilty of anything. I'm just doing counting, as I said. Right? Um, here's another special kind of graphs. Acyclic means what? No cycles. Uh, and directed. Acyclic. A cyclic, a directed graph. So this this they thing, it's called in one word DAC. Those are extremely important in many applications, uh, both for graphs and for AI and data science. Uh, for mathematics and computer science, DACs are much easier to handle than regular graphs in terms of procedures. Whatever you want to do with them, sort them, rearrange them, insert, delete. Uh, organize things. And there is a process that takes a graph and breaks it into DAGs. So whatever you want to do with a graph, maybe you do it on DAGs first and then deal with it, how to expand it to the whole graph. But, but DAGs are, are easier to, to model. So here's how they look like. There's a, is there a difference between DAG and trees? A cyclic, directed, 
and uh, no cycles connected. Is that, is that roughly the same thing? So here's how I can have a, a DAG that's not a, effectively a tree. I know this is directed and trees are undirected. Because if, if I have a root, that becomes directed because from the root down. But if I have a no root, usually it's undirected. So here's what can happen in a DAG. In a DAG, I may have this kind of situation. Is this a DAG? Is it doesn't have cycle, is directed. Is this a tree? No. It looks like it, it has like kind of like a cycle visually, but it's not really a cycle. Why is this not a cycle here? This whole thing? Why can't we say these four vertices form a cycle in this graph? If the cycle has to come back in the direction of the edges. In here, if you if you look at this, you can't really, at some point, if you want to make this a cycle, you'd have to go against an edge, which is not allowed, right? So this is a DAG right here. And DAGs have a very nice property. Say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, K, I. DAGs have an amazing property. That's why everybody likes them so much. DAG implies there is something called topological sort. I know. Let's let's not use this name, huh? That's the correct name, but you don't have to. Let's call it line. It says if you have a DAG like that one, you can put all the vertices on a line and all edges vertices online, all edges go left to right. Can we organize this graph on a line such that all edges will have to go from the left to the right? Which, who should be the first nodes on that line? A and E. Can I put them in any order on the line? He said, a and E have to go first because the edges, there's no edge to A and E, but the edge is from A and E. But between A and E, can I put them in any order I want on the line? Yeah. Let's say E first, then A, then who else needs to go on that line? Call it, call it this like zero, because they, they don't have any edges. Who needs to go on the line next? <laughs> B. C, who else? F. F, does it matter what order do I have in there, in this group? No. Unless there's an H in between them, right? Currently between B, C, F, G, there's no H, so I can put them this way. But what if there is an H from G to C? Is that still a DAG? Did I just create a cycle here? Yes or no? Right. So there's no cycle. It's still organizable on a line. But now what needs to happen between G and C? G needs to go first. Right? G and C. Uh, and that C is not anymore level 1. Because C, it's got to be after E and after G. So C is really at level 2 now. So who else needs to be there? How about D, H, and all that? D has to be after C. Um, but how about between H and C? Which one can go first? Either way, can I put H and then C? Like that? And then what else needs to be there? K, D, right? And uh, this is, um, sorry, H and C are level, yeah. and how does this work? 
and then K and D. H is here. H has to be before K and D. Right? And the last one is I. So now let's do the edges. A to B, it's right here, it's an edge. A to C, uh, B to D, F to H, G to C, uh, H to D, H to K, C to D, does K has anything? K to Y, and D to Y. So I'm going to leave this a little bit for you to think about. If I want to organize it this way, what are the groups? How can I determine some clear groups on, the, on this axis? Again, the order is not fixed. I could permute some of them and still get them right. Remember the constraint. All the arrows have to be from left to right. Um, is it necessary, like when you're defining the layers, like 0, 1, that you pick, that you place it into the, the layer that's the shortest path to get to it? Or are there other ways of doing it? That's my question for you okay. guys. How do you organize those layers? I want to tell you that there are some layers and the way to think about it is there the shortest one? So like this C, right? C is reachable from A in one step mm -hmm. and from uh, E in two steps. My question specifically is C should be in the first group or second group. Okay. If I'm to put groups. I think everybody understands that this can be put on a line and uh, all the edges have to go left to right. But what about those groups? If I want to determine some groups, group zero, group one, group two. Clearly group zero is the one that has no edges coming in. And the last group is the nodes that have no. Who's in the last group? No edges going out. Because if you're in the last group, you can have edges going somewhere. That, that would be the last group. OK, so those are very important graphs because algorithms work much faster on those graph tags. And a lot of the graphs, regular graphs, can be broken into in various ways that this approximation with tags for us. Now, can I do this with a regular graph? I take a regular graph, G. Can I just do topological sort? Not in the tag, in a regular graph. Why can't I do it for any graph? Why is this not possible? If there is cycles, why is it not possible with cycles? Yes. There's a cycle that at some point when you go back to something you've been previously to the left. Right. You can have in a cycle all the edges to the right. At some point you have to go back to where you started. So that means eventually in the cycle there's got to be an edge back left, right? Because there is an edge back right left. OK, so that's a thing with graphs. I think we've done mostly everything you need for the homework, except for the algorithms. Uh, before, I, before I do that, I left something as exercise, and I, I have a feeling nobody looked at it. Uh, right? And I don't want to leave it like that. So as a recap for last time, we talk about HSL standing from? What is this? Hand shaking lemma. What did it say? Anybody remembers? Nobody proved this exercise. It was saying sum of the all vertices, if I want to take the degree of that vertex, if I sum up all the degrees, what's the degree of this guy here? What's the degree here? 
What's the degree here? What's the degree here? One. That's what I'm adding up, the degrees. This is equal what? To what? Two times the number of edges. Anybody prove this level? I tell you how to do it. We say idea count incidence. Incidence is when an edge hits a vertex. That's an incidence. So right here. Incidence two ways. If I count by vertices, what's the total incidence? If I go vertex by vertex, how much incidence is in here? Right? By vertices is the is the degree of each vertex, right? That's how the incidence is the degree because every incidence is caused by an edge, right? So then whatever the degree is, is how many edges are incident in there, right? So that's going to be, by degrees, is the sum of the vertices. And in here, I count by edges. I count the same thing. Every edge has how many incident points? Two points. So it's the number of edges times two incidents each. If you go like vertices, every vertex have a bunch of incident points that corresponds to the degree. So I sum those degrees, I get the total. I'm counting total incidents. If I go by the edges, I count for each edge how many incident points? Two. So that's two e, that's the sum of degrees. It's counting the same quantity, the number of these dots, in two different ways. How about a proof of this lemma by induction. I'm going to do the same proof, but now I'm going to do by induction. I've got the graph of V uh, and E. The induction is going to be from a set E to a set E plus another edge. So this is says I'm adding an edge to the graph. So I had this graph before with a bunch of edges in, in them, right? Something. And I'm saying if it worked for this graph, for this graph I have sum over degree of vertices is two times the number of edges. The induction step is from E edges, I'm adding an edge. So if this is, you know, UV, I'm adding this edge, that's the new edge. So how is it gonna work by induction? I'm gonna say, I wanna prove now in my new graph, which is the old graph plus one edge, that this still works. So in the new graph, there is an additional edge is the old graph plus edge UV. That's the new edge. So now in here, I do the sum of the degrees of all vertices. I already know the sum. So I, I know this worked before adding edge UV. Now I want to prove it with edge UV in. Um, this is what I want here. I want the sum to be two times the edge, the old edge set is the old set with with edge UV in there. That's supposed to be in parentheses because it's a pair. So now I'm saying that's what I want, but I, I'm relating my new customers to the old customers. This is the sum of all the degrees for all vertices except U and V plus the degree of U plus the degree of V. I'm taking those terms out the sum. And this on the right side 
is 2e plus 2, because the new edge added 1 times 2 is 2, right? Now I break this degree of u into the old degree of u before this edge plus 1, right? Because this degree, if you look at the degree here, the incident at the same incident points like before, this is the new incident point. Let me, let me do it nice. So this in here and this in here are the old ones. This is the new one. So it's the old degree plus 1. And this one here is the old degree for V plus 1. And I still want this to be 2E plus 2. Now 2 goes away with plus 1 plus 1. And I'm getting that the sum of degrees, I think this is all vertices, all degrees. Degrees is 2 times number of edges, which is true from induction hypothesis. This essentially says, this was what worked before in this graph. Before adding the edge of V, you had this problem. Hands up, excuse me. I prove this by induction over number of edges. When I say over edges, means I added one more edge. And your exercise, prove Unshaking lemma by induction over vertices. That is, I'm looking at my graph and I'm adding a vertex. The new part is a vertex here that has some edges. So I'm adding a vertex with a bunch of edges. Show that if the handshaking lemma was 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 true before for the other graph, this node with all the edges. It's true now for the new node with its edges and everything that comes with it. So the only two other things that I want to cover now, actually I want to do more things, but let's see how far we get. Is um, this traversal algorithm. about that. I have two traversal algorithms. Here's a graph. Another one. Do it in the middle so I don't have to throw it twice. Rush forgot about uh, G in here. <laughs> There's no G in this That's okay, it's just a naming, you know. But uh, clearly, you write it too fast, skip the G, you know. Uh, BFS. So I start in A. Anybody knows what BFS stands for? Right. Some people call it a timid. You 
if I start in A, BFS, uh, actually, I used to call it in the algorithm class wave traversal, because it's like ocean waves. Uh, let's uh, get this marker and say A starts in there, so A is wave zero. Who gets to be connected from A? So A, it's a starting point, it's at level zero. Who's at level one? B and D, right? Yeah. B and D. Because they are reachable. And F2. From A. This is zero. And then who's in this layer here? This is level one. So this is uh, one, one, one. Who's now reachable from layer? Hmm? C and E are reachable. Everybody's reachable now. C, E, I, and uh, H, reachable from previous layer. She just wave. So this is the wave here. So how does this work? I put myself in A, and I'm saying, where can I reach from here? B and C, B and D and F. So now I have that wave. Where can I reach from here? H, I, and C. And then uh, let's add something to it. Let's say there's another node here. Let's put a G here. That will be in. So this is now. This is wave two. And this is wave three. Easy, right? I, I count, I really want you to think when you hear BFS of these waves. What can I reach? Zero is where I start. What can I reach in one step? What can I reach in two steps? But not in one, see, that's critical. This H is reachable in two steps, it's in wave two, but it's not reachable in one step. If H would be reachable in one step, it'd be in what wave? One, right? Um, so F is reachable in one step, but also reachable in three steps, right? Because I can go B, H, F. So F is in what wave? One or three? One. One. It's reachable in one step, it's in wave one. How about DFS? This stands for what? aggressive um, step first. So in here, I don't explore the whole wave. I'll, I'll, I'll go as far as I can in one direction first. Right. So how do I do that? Um, if I want to do it here in this graph, I start at A, and then after A, who comes next? I have a choice of where to go from A. I can go to D, I can go to B, I can go to uh, F. Let's say I go to D first. Once I'm in D, in, in the BFS world, I'll have to complete the layer B, D, and F everywhere I can reach. In here, I don't pay attention to B, and F until I finish D, right? I go as far as I can in one direction. So what will go next after D? So I have to think about like in a tree. From A, I go to D, right? And then I go to, where can I go from D? I can go to C, to E, or to I. Pick one at random, say I go to E, 
where else can I go from, from E? C. C. I stop, right? You see in here, can I go anywhere else from C? No. So now I go back to E. So this is my first back step. So let's, let's count the steps here. This is step one, step two, step three. Now I go back at step four. I say, okay, uh, you finish this, you go back to E. Can, can you go anywhere else from E? So I already went to C. Where else can I go from E? Anywhere new. Can I go anywhere? No. So then uh, we go back to D, that's step five. And now from D, can I go anywhere else? Where? That's step six. And now from I, I can go to multiple places. Right? Can I go somewhere new? I can go to F, right? From F, can I go somewhere new? And from H? B? From B, I have nowhere to go. That's back. From H, I know I know where to go. That's back. From F, I have anywhere to go. That's back. And from I, do I have somewhere to go? <coughs> from G, I have somewhere to go. No, I go back. From I, I have anywhere else to explore. I've done that. I have done F and G. I have nowhere to go. So I return from I back to D, right? That's step 14. And then from D, do I have anywhere new to go? I go back to A. And now from A, do I have any node that I can explore further? No, because I've done all of them in the meantime. So see how this B in the BFS got discovered in the, in the first wave. That's pretty quick, pretty early. But in the DFS before, because I went this way, B got discovered all the way to like, uh, the path discovered from A to B is effectively A, D, I, F, H, B. A, D, I, F, H, B. When a much simpler path, shorter path from A would have been just A to B. But that's not the path this algorithm discovered. Now, because I picked nodes at random, could I have picked B instead of D to go first? What would have been the DFS in that case? Go to A, first to B. From B, where can I go? H. H. From H, where can I go? F. From F, where can I go? I. From I. G. And then I go back from G, and from I, where can I go? D. D. And from D? I could have got this advancement in DFS if I started to B instead of D. And that's a random choice. So this is a valid DFS pass. This is also a valid DFS pass. Because every time we pick a new node, we pick an at random. And we might easily be B or D, you know? We don't know. Um, so in this algorithm here, who's in what wave is deterministic, right? The order B D F S is B B D F is not. But if I'm asking you how many steps it took from A to reach to C, can you look at this and say definitely two steps or not? If I'm asking how many steps does it take from A to reach to C? In C C in the second wave, can you say it takes two steps for sure? But in here, if I say how many steps it takes from A to reach to say F or B, can you look at one of these classes and say one, two, three, it takes three steps or five steps? No. That depending on how you went, if you go the other way, you might reach B right away. B is in like one step away from A, and here it's like six steps away from A. So it matters which way 
you can't really say B is that far away from A in BFS, because you can't have gone another way. So I have many interesting questions about this BFS. For example, if I really want the shortest path, I run any DFS we want. This one, this one, this one of them are random. I want to know what's the f the shortest path, the is the most reachable. Like see in BFS, how nicely I get B is one step away and C is two steps away, and that's guaranteed. Can you produce that out of DFS somehow? Can you modify the DFS to say I know B is one step away, not six steps away? That's a question I ask my master students. How do you modify DFS so that at the end? you know how far B is. Another question that I have, that's not that hard, is, is this always a tree? This is what's being produced here by advancement to the new node. Is that always a tree? I'm not counting the back steps, just the forward steps. Is that a tree? Always? As a name, as a DFS tree. It has, BFS has a tree too? Is there a BFS tree? What is that? A goes to where? B, D, and F. And from B, where else can we go? How about H? Is that which? Can I put uh, F and D go to H together? Is that, would that be correct? That would be correct as connectivity, but not correct in BFS. In BFS, Whoever goes first, that one gets to go to the next one. So if B got first and F, because this is random order here in this column. If B is first, then B goes to H and not F. By the time F observes this edge, H is already discovered. So where can I go from D? C. Yeah, and? E. And from F? I. So is this always a tree? Is that always a tree? Root a tree? If D goes first, why wouldn't D go to I instead of F? Who goes first? So you said, so we're looking at D before F. E? So why would no I? Why does D not go to I instead of F? D? Yes. To I? Yes. I is here? Yes. D doesn't have a, oh, D does. <laughs> You're right. Very good. D goes first, so D goes to I. Very good. Now, those are trees. And because they're trees, they have very important properties, three properties. When I say BFS tree, at the end of the DFS algorithm, we just, we not only simply see the traversal, but keeping track of that tree is critical to do something with the DFS algorithm. So I'd like to show you uh, some demonstrative slides that I use in my algorithms class. That is, uh, will be easier for some of you to follow that conceptually, uh, to, like on the board. And for some of you, it will be easier to follow it uh, with the slides. animations with cycles and uh, paths and um, some things that you have to be clear on is this uh, matrix versus adjacency in this representation. We talk about this, this is very easy, but make sure you understand it exact before you, there's some two homework problems that deal with this. This matrix is dense, it has V times V and 0, 1. 
this is not dense. It only has edges that are here. You can prove handshaking lemma right here. How many total atoms are here? If I go by the edges, it would be two times that, right? Because every edge is in here and in here. This is two places. An edge, you know, two to three will be in two lists. And if I go by vertices, I get the degrees. Every list is how many connections are, so that's the degree. So if I sum up all the uh, arrows by rows, I get the degrees, and by columns, I get the edges, so that's another proof for handshake. Path cycles, the one, one I want to show you is this BFS animation. If I can make it work. So that's another graph. Um, this one is directed. You can apply those algorithms in directed and undirected graphs. Remember, in directed graphs, an edge exists only in that direction. You can't go the other way. So BFS starts, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of waves. Literally, I look at the ocean and I see the waves. So that's wave zero. When can I reach from there? That's wave one, right? When can I reach from there? That's wave two. And that's wave three where I reach until the end, right? So that way I know for sure this node D here, it's in wave two, is reachable in two steps, but not in one. Because if it be one, it would be the previous way. Now, here's a pseudo code for BFS. We're gonna talk about this next time. There is some particular trick in the pseudo code. I'm sure you could easily understand the steps. The difficult part is this. What is this? DQ, what does that mean? And MQ. So I'm sure everybody could, could understand immediately what this means right now. That's exactly what we talked to the board, how do you traverse, navigate the graph. But MQ and DQ are complicated things. We didn't do those at all. We'll have to do them next time. Qs, how do you uh, use the Q data structure? I want to show an animation for DFS. And I want to emphasize, DFS is much more complicated than it looks. The reason for this complication is, one, the fact that depending where I go changes the entire DFS tree. If I choose that node, I get one traversal. If I choose a different node, I get a completely different traversal. But the only way to understand DFS correctly is to mark those times, those steps that I mark on the edges, step one, advance to that node. Step three, go back to the previous node. To do those, we're going to mark those start and finishing times. And we're going to do a little coloring here. Coloring means initially all nodes are not discovered. They're all white. As soon as I reach a node, do I still have this thing in here? I don't know if you guys can see it. When I reach a node, it's gray. I discover stuff from it. The moment I return from that node, I mark it black, like finished. I discover everything I could. So I start with A, and I do starting here. What do I say there? It's step one. I started A. What do I do then? I go, I choose from A, I could have gone where? D, B, and F in this graph, right? So I say I go to D. From D, what can I do? I can go to, so I mark those starting steps. At step three, I discovered E, and when I discover a node, I mark it gray. The reason I mark them gray is to know later on if it's a white node needs to be discovered or not, because I may end up with an edge back to a gray node, and I need to know is that a new node or not. White means not discovered, gray means I'm in the process of discovering it, Black means I'm done. <laughs> so now I'm finishing that because there's no place to go from E. And I mark the finishing time four. Four is when I decided E is done. So that is color black. Hands up who's with me. Now, if I finish four, where do I go? To D. D is still in the process, is the parent of E in the tree, in the DFS tree, and it's the process of being done. But from D I can go to F, right? F, it's marked as starting at, this counter always increases by one, right? Step five, I discovered F. From F, can I go anywhere? So what am I gonna do now? Done F, and then I go back to 
D. And what happens at D? I'm done, I have nowhere to go, and then I go where? I go at A, but at A I'm not done. A is still gray, because A is still in the process of being discovered. I do A, I go to B, and then from B can I go somewhere? I only go to white nodes, because those are the DFS3 advancements to the white nodes. Now G is 9, 10 is done because nowhere to go, come back, 11, stop it, it's black. Now what happens now? Back to A, is A done? At time 12. Now, huh, did I finish? No, no why not? There's some nodes left, but why is it that they're left? They're white, why, why is that? They're not reachable from A. If you like, in, a, in an undirected sense, they are connected to A, right? Because there's some edges, but the edges are backwards. So I can't really reach from A to C. Those are the, by far the most interesting problems. When the graph looks connected, but it's really not, right? You get the graph and say, um, why is it that DFS has to do multiple runs or three runs? How many? Uh, Imagine a DFS that starts from A got stuck. How about one that starts from C? Would that get stuck? Mm. Can I reach everywhere from C? Yeah. Can I? So if I run a DFS from C, I wouldn't get stuck. But with one from A, I do get stuck. So what happens here, I need to start another DFS. I start one, that's time 13, that's the next counter always increases by one. 14, 15, 16. Now there are multiple kind of edges in here. The edges that I used are the DFS three edges. That was the advancement edges. This was an advancement edge from here to here. But there are other edges like this one that I didn't use for advancement. By the time I got to E, this edge was a back edge to A. So this back edge is a clear indication of a, let me roll it back. Here I got to E, right? In E, I'm saying go everywhere you can. When I saw go everywhere you can, I will look at the efficiency list, right? I say, where can I go from here? Well, there's only one edge that's going out of here, and that's, I'm in this node, it points to this gray node. That's not an interesting edge for discovering your nodes, right? Because A is not white, it's gray. But what is this edge showing me? A back edge to gray. Cycle. This shows me a cycle. DFS is very good at finding cycles. Every time I process either node and I see an edge back to a gray node that's still open, it is not white or black. White will be a new node. Black will be I'm done here. Gray means you you coming from here. Gray is still explored, so it means I'm coming from here. This edge is an easy indication of a cycle. So if I want to find cycles in the graph. I can run DFS and look for these packages. What we didn't do, we'll do next time, is how do you actually program those things? That's on paper. But if I want to write a program for DFS or DFS, how do I do it? Oh, there's nothing this week, so I'll see you guys Tuesday. Ah, there's office hours this week. I'll be at 10 p.m. on office hours. I can tell the government that it's legal for me to murder. Yes. Is it legal? Okay. Oh, I'll be there at 6 if anybody has questions. Of course. I know there's no homework, but if people have questions, I'll ask you. Oh. I can speak more Chinese than her. I think we have no one can have if it's a sponge graph, you're right. It's so easy that it takes the time twice. Oh, but no. in general, that's in Tokyo. Yeah, that's really, 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 really
which is all usually E except when the graph is in this part. So edges is the bottom. Okay. So that's fine. Uh, is it from this class? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think the... Let, let me, let me just... Uh, you can email her. I'll email her. Thank you. What was the name?